I suppose first, even before I begin, uh, I do want to thank in particular uh, Christina and Michael Beauvais for, for just being um, you know, the best managers that uh, a workshop can have in terms of their diligence and, 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 and good cheer uh, and just all around excellence. So thank you uh, to you both. Uh, we, Jan and I, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of Jan to say that we really could not do the work that we do without, without all of your work. So thank you um, for everything. So my name is Edward Dove. I'm a lecturer in law uh, at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Regulator Regulatory and Ethics Workstream. And I'm delighted to update you on some of our work done since the last plenary, which was an in-person meeting, of course, in Boston. Uh, this year, we've gone virtual. Uh, next slide, Christina, please. So for those of you, perhaps, who are new to the Workstream, uh, I think it is worth saying a little bit about our kind of foundations and what our motivation and mandate is. So, not surprisingly, the clue partly is in the title. We focus on the regulatory and ethics issues uh, as it relates to, to genomic and health-related data sharing. But part of our work from the very beginning has been grounded in the internationally recognized human rights of everyone uh, to benefit from the progress of science and its applications. And indeed, you will find that right in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this was work that uh, Arthur, Arthur Knoppers in particular pioneered on. And that was really the driving force uh, in the early work that we did well back in uh, 2013, uh, which led to the framework for responsible sharing of genomic and health related data. And that was really uh, a wonderful experience in policy making uh, uh, in the early days of the Global Alliance. And um, that has really taken off in terms of the translational success. So I, I, I can't remember the number we had uh, in, in Boston last year, but going into this, this plenary, we had 13 translations now of this framework. And hot off the press, I'm delighted to announce just yesterday, we have received two additional translations in Finnish and Dutch. So um, this really speaks, I think, to the global, the global aim of the Global Alliance, which is not just to promulgate documents that might still be relatively inaccessible because of linguistic or other grounds. So at the very least, having these translations, I really think, enables us, enables us, us, uh, us to, to diffuse our policies uh, internationally. So uh, well done, and, and thank you to all of the translation teams for your hard work uh, over the years in, in translating the framework. Next slide, please. So just to briefly talk about uh, new, new approved tools, tools uh, in the past year, and this is partly based on, uh, on comments from you within the Alliance in terms of aspects that you thought the, the regulatory and ethics work stream should really focus on, and that was consent, consent, consent. So in, in all its facets. So you'll hear a lot about consent uh, in, in a subsequent presentation. But just to highlight some of the things that we've done even in the past year about consent, one was a version to approval of the consent policy that Susan Wallace uh, led on. Um, and this was uh, elements of best practices to guide, to guide organizations um, in consent procedures when it comes to thinking about consent processes and documents and so on when it comes to genomic and health related data sharing. So that was the second iteration that came out in 2019. We also had machine readable consent guidance, which is really great work with, with, with uh, tr trying to design consent language that can be attached to data sets and stored in the descriptive data using duo terms. So that was a, a, a lot of uh, hard work went into that. Um, and likewise, consent clauses for genomic research. This is a classic issue. And so that was really about providing researchers with sample phrases that they could apply and contextualize uh, when it comes to addressing various consent elements. Other policy updates to very briefly talk about, data privacy and security policy went through its second iteration in 2019. Um, that of course uh, has, has been a, a core issue from the get-go, concerns about uh, data, data protection and privacy and security and how projects can be governed in a way that uh, guides, um, or that promotes sharing of genomic and health related data in a way that protects and promotes the confidentiality, integrity and availability of data and services. We also had an updated ethics review recognition policy. Uh, so this is about trying to address the concerns of multiple ethics committee reviews for multi-site studies and, and how that often can lead, can lead to duplication and, and inconsistency and often not, not for suitable justifications. So let's think about working around that. There's a turn to deal with intellectual property. Uh, we know that's a core issue in the Global Alliance and so it's in a natural home in the regular ethics work stream. So a copyright policy was promulgated just this past year to think about uh, uh, the GA for GH's um, 
uh, operations in terms of, of already on the good side of copyright law. Next slide, please. Very briefly, but importantly, want to highlight the great work that, uh, that, that we're doing in the Regulatory Ethics Workshop on the GDPR. This, as you, for those of you who just joined us in the previous session, this is an ongoing core concern of many genomic research organizations for good reason. Uh, and so we've addressed this, or, or constantly addressed this, by keeping a watching brief on developments in terms of what governments are doing with the GDPR and what research organizations are doing. So we have, to date, 27 briefs that are, that are uh, uh, released monthly. And so please do sign up if you're interested in, in, in uh, reading these briefs. They're very short. They're meant to be short and readable. And also to submit your questions in case that anything that you read in the briefs today have not addressed issues, challenges you're facing in your organization or just want some, some clarification on. Next slide, please. So for those of you that joined us on Monday, you know that one of our, our ongoing uh, work is on data access committees now. So uh, Vasil Rahim today at Stanford and Jonathan Lawson at the Broad Institute and myself are thinking about procedural standards uh, for data access committees, a crucial uh, uh, um, actor in the world of genomic and health related data sharing. Um, and so trying to develop best practices to drive consistency and robust reviews for data access requests. This is uh, a fun project that just got off the ground this summer and will take us well into 2021. Uh, finishing up my, my portion of the presentation, I wanted to briefly highlight the work that um, uh, colleagues at Osaka University, as well as Miguel uh, and Adrian, who's now at the One Plus Million Genomes Initiative, are doing for a standard genomic data licenses and agreements. And that's really about uh, developing international best practices for licensing data and other scientific resources. I'm sure Jan uh, and Kazuto and Chisato and Adrian, if they are on the line, can speak more to that if time permits. Next slide, please. Very briefly, just highlight some recent work. Uh, again, if you were there on Monday, uh, you heard the great uh, um, uh, session led by Robert Green and Anna Lewis at Harvard to develop a new uh, policy proposal for genomic return of results. And so their starting point is that clause there. Um, I would encourage you, and when the slides become available after the talk, to follow the links and please um, do send your, your comments and feedback into Robert and to Anna. I know they were very keen to solicit feedback on their proposal in early days, but that's exactly why uh, the more feedback you provide, the better. So please do have a look at that um, when you can. And then very briefly, just to highlight uh, the systematic review uh, that uh, Danya Veers, Madeline Murtaugh, Stephanie Roberts, and Joel Minion had led on. This was a really uh, fantastic survey where they did a review of about 100, I think it was 184 peer review publications reporting on empirical findings from 2005 to 2020, and some really, really great uh, results that, that, that um, came from that systematic review and, and the conclusion you see there. So well done to all of, all of those colleagues. Next slide, please. Well, that was me. So just thir thir uh, three minutes over time. Uh, <clears throat> apologies for that. So we will start with a presentation from the Your DNA, Your Say Global Survey. Really interesting, exciting recent news to share. So. Uh, look forward to hearing from that. And then we'll turn to the GA for GH consent toolkits that Bartha Knopper, Susan Wallace, Migendor, and Christina are leading on. And then Michael will talk to us about the COVID-19 pan COVID pandemic work we're doing and ending with a presentation on the participant patient uh, public engagement policy with Mavis and, and colleagues. So looking forward to all of that. Christina, I'll, I'll let you um, follow the next slide on. And may I introduce, is it Richard? Are you leading the presentation for this today? Yeah, I am. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, Richard. Over to you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so next slide, please, please Christina. Um, yes, yeah, so thanks very much for the chance to talk about the uh, Your DNA, Your Say study. Um, and um, I'm here on behalf of Anna Middleton, who leads the study, and also of this um, ever-growing network of uh, collaborators involved in um, delivering Your DNA, Your Say um, around the world. So next slide, please. So Your DNA, Your Say is a, is a global um, large scale global survey with the with a couple of aims so the, the kind of primary aim is to understand um, questions around familiarity with willingness to donate and attitudes towards kind of genomic and health data but we're also very keen particularly within within a ga4 gh context that it's um, bringing public views glo these global public views to inform the development of frameworks and policy by um, international bodies like ga4 gh and also at national levels so next slide please so just to give you an idea of the scope of the study, it's, it's become ever-expanding. It's um, 
it's that we've, we, when we close data collection for our um, meta-analysis at the end of last year, we had th over 37,000 responses from 22 countries in 15 languages. And wherever possible, we've tried to sample representative publics from those countries. Um, so you know, it's kind of gives you a scope of the, the, the countries that we're covering and um, an illustration of what the online survey looks like in, in different languages, um, which has presented all kinds of enjoyment with um, fitting fonts to websites and all kinds of things like that. But um, next slide, please. So, yeah, so the news that Ted was referring to, so we've just had um, in the last week or two, we've just had the first global meta-analysis paper from Your DNA, Your Say um, published. So this is um, in the American Journal of Human Genetics and the, the citations at the top there if you want to follow up. Um, and what I'm going to do in the next slide, in the next few slides, is give some spoilers on the kind of headline findings of that. Of that. But I would encourage you to actually go and you know, have a look at it, have a look at the analysis. And we've also, over the last year or so, had um, four or five other papers out looking particularly at the, in, the data from the UK, USA, Canada and Australia, and also from Germany. So next slide, please. So overall, if we were to pick out, pick out the headline findings are that the, me the members of the public worldwide are predominantly unfamiliar with genomics, DNA, genetics. That overall, the willingness for uh, people's willingness to donate their DNA and health data for research is comparatively low. And that trust in sharing data beyond an individual's own doctor, so particularly once you're talking about multiple users of data, is also low. When you talk about sharing with an individual's own doctor, the, the trust is very high. But once you move beyond that, it starts to drop off. So next slide, please. Those people who are more willing to donate oh, are more likely to be familiar with genomics, genetics or DNA. And they, people are more likely, even more likely to be willing to donate if they're personally familiar, if they have personal experience of either genomic medicine or um, genetic medicine, or either in their family or professionally. Um, interestingly, people who see DNA as different to other forms of health information also, also seem to be more likely to be willing to donate. Um, when people are donating data for use by a doctor, they're more likely to be willing to donate. And then, as you might expect, people who trust in the user, it, so trust in, in the users of data, and particularly in this multiple uses of data, is associated with an increased willingness to donate. So in terms of where we're going next with this, so next slide, please. It raises the question of what is it that can build trust? And this is where you move from the kind of trying to, trying to get from the global picture to something that's, that's potentially policy relevant and so we have the kind of question within the study in terms of what what kind of information would help people would help people trust and so we're looking at this across the across the study and particularly pulling out at a national level what are the what are the options from this list that people are most likely to say would increase their trust um, so if you go to the next slide so this is when we look across the countries the option the the options that are selected globally so this is a consolidated ranking where it's worked out individually for each country and then weighted in order to come up with a consolidated list and the things that come out at the top of that list are these questions of transparent information about who's going to benefit from data access a the the option to withdraw information in the future and then knowing exactly who is using information and for what purpose. So a kind of trans trans transparency and its ability to withdraw. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, that weighted ranking is also reflected when you look at um, the kind of distribution of the percentages within each country selecting each option. But what you also start to see is the fact that, that, that this isn't a kind of homogenous global global view but that there is some variation at national levels and this is one of the things we're interested in in exploring and pulling out and particularly looking at countries which tend to, which which may cluster together or um, form particular particular groups um, and so you see particular variation around um, so things like the importance of access to one's own DNA um, and countries that are kind of that are consistently outliers or um, yeah, or, or absent from being out, or not outliers, I suppose, part of the kind of core group. So um, 
in conclusion, so as not to, yeah, for next slide, please. Um, hopefully, keeping within the ten, the ten minutes before the ten minutes. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so some of the conclusions we're pulling out so far: this kind of questions of willingness to donate, familiarity with genomics, and overall levels of trust are low across the your DNA, your say sample, um, and that higher levels of trust are clearly linked to a greater willingness to make personal genomic and health data available for research. And that some of the things that seem to be most important in terms of increasing people's trust are these questions of transparency about data, about who's going to benefit, who's using, and the ability to, to withdraw data. So um, I've just got one acknowledgement slide at the end. So there is yeah, an incredible number of people involved in this in delivering this project, um, and we had our one of our, um, our first kind of meeting of the entire group um, a couple of weeks ago um, and it's great to see people coming together and starting on the analysis as well so um, yeah, watch this space um, if you are interested in finding out more then on the next slide Christina um, is my email and Anna's email and that's a, um, some of the work you can follow up that has been published so far so, thanks many thanks indeed for that Richard and and uh tremendous work done there and, and for any of you uh, who, are, who are participating in this session have any questions please type them in the chat box and we'll see at the end if there is time for questions uh, and we can ask our, 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 our panelists to to respond to the questions but thank you and obviously the work that you're doing feeds in very much into the work that the consent colleagues are doing with with their consent toolkits to know that there's a lot of uh, of great material that can be applied there so without further ado may we proceed to the next presentation Um, so I'm going to be uh, presenting on behalf of Susan and Bartha and Christina. Uh, my name is Meg Dorr, um, and I am at Sage Bionetworks in the United States. And I'm going to be telling you about our consent toolkit. Really, as Ed, uh, just as Ted was just saying, you know, growing directly out of the transparency mandates um, that we're finding um, through your DNA, your say. Should go to the next slide. Yeah. So we have lots and lots of people who have been involved in this work and uh, tremendous thanks to all of them and to all of um, all of the folks who've been uh, working to contribute um, consent documents to us to help uh, move this work forward. Next slide. Um, so we have a whole suite of um, work that we've been doing in consent. Um, including uh, consent clauses for genomic research, which was just approved, which is tremendous. Um, the consent clauses for large scale initiatives, which is an ongoing piece of work right now, um, which started out as national initiatives, but really has grown to encompass any large scale genomic initiatives worldwide. Um, consent clauses for whole genome sequencing, which is on the, on the horizon for 2021. Um, we have also published consent clauses for rare disease research, um, which there's the reference there for you if you're interested, and generic familial clauses, uh, which we're working on right now. Um, it's been posted, as it says here, um, uh, Bartha worked uh, to lead this typology, um, and, uh, and we invite your comments, uh, please. Next slide. So just to give an overview of how all of these pieces fit together, we have the large scale initiatives work, the genomic research work, the whole genome testing and routine clinical care, all of these pieces of work which are, which are ongoing right now, as well as the familial clauses which transect all three of those pieces of work. Um, and from all of these, for projects, we are delivering um, generic um, informed consent clauses that can be picked up um, by driver projects, national initiatives, and other projects in genomics research uh, for use in their own research studies. So trying to uh, create some, a multinational um, data bank, as it were, of, of transparent um, and useful um, consent clauses. Next slide. Uh, so just to dive in a little bit um, more deeply here, we have Susan's uh, been leading this work since uh, 2015 and now updated. Um, it was formally approved um, just this summer, which is tremendous and is now available on the GA4GH website. Um, 
lots of tremendous resources here. I would really encourage you um, to go and take a look at it uh, for anybody who's involved in the regulatory and ethics um, space within genomic research, a tremendous resource. Um, also important to note the machine readable guidance. Um, creating machine readable consent is really one of the things that we're focused a lot on now um, to allow um, consent to flow as metadata with the data as, as it gets used around the world. Um, so uh, dive in um, there for more details. Next up. Uh, the large scale initiatives um, consent clauses. This is work that I've been leading with Christina doing really the yeoman's work. Uh, we are um, right now in a process uh, with creating this typology um, of all of the different uh, informed consent clauses. So categorizing each of the um, consents with their different clause types. Um, and then we will be deriving from that uh, generic consent clauses as well as a narrative analysis of our findings um, to be published in 2021. So um, looking at the practice of large-scale genomic uh, research around the world and, and consolidating the informed consent clauses uh, from those resources. Next is the familial <clears throat> consent clauses. This is uh, work that uh, Bartha and Christina have done. Uh, the catalog has been completed. The typology of clauses, again, I mentioned earlier, please uh, comment on it. Um, and we are working on the generic consent clauses. I think this work is really critical um, as we as we think about the results coming out of your DNA or say this work on familial clauses is really, really critical to um, strengthening the covenant of trust that we seek to develop with our research participants by by transparently disclosing to them risks not only to themselves but to their conceptualization of family or community. Next slide. All right. <clears throat> so a little bit more about the typology um, from the familial consent clauses, um, the legal duty to communicate, physician discretion, patient preference, the IRB approved plan, so plan for, for releasing or not re releasing results to family members, intrafamilial outreach, also very important to consider, the right to be left alone, um, as was highlighted in uh, in the Q&A in the general session um, earlier, and then uh, uh, the stigmatization and discrimination warnings. So these are our key focus foci um, for, for fulfilling our um, responsibility for transparent disclosure of familial genetic risk within genomic research um, and genomic care. Thanks, Christina. Next slide. So. Um, Next, <laughs> Bartha um, uh, is just a dynamo of energy while working on all of these consent clauses. Next up, we're really thinking about the clinical um, genetic and genomic consent clauses. We've seen a number of the national initiatives really um, straddling the research and clinical care world. And so uh, we're working on generic consent clause clauses. Uh, we would really appreciate if you could send in uh, consent to genetic testing um, in clinical forms to us, uh, to Christina. Um, the more examples we have, uh, the better our generic consent clauses will be um, as we return those um, as value to, uh, to the research ecosystem and the clinical care ecosystem here at the, at the Alliance. Um, we have a uh, we had a workshop um, earlier this week, um, which many of you, I'm sure, attended. Uh, if you, in case you missed it, um, we have uh, some uh, um, the clauses that are going to be posted on uh, the website for comment. Are they ready yet, Christina? I know we received a lot of feedback at the at the meeting on the 28th. Um, so they're not on the website yet, but they will be very soon. And yeah. we, yeah, they are already. We have already circulated them, and uh, they will be shared more broadly very soon. That's great. That's great. That's wonderful. So, um, so be looking for that to be coming out uh, shortly. And with that, I think maybe I have hit the mark for time. One minute early, um, so so well done to you.
Um, Michael, would you would you like to to lead a discussion now on the regular genetic expert streams work on COVID nineteen? Yes, wonderful. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone. Um, so, I'm going to speak about the ruse. Um, COVID-19 work. Uh, next slide, please, Christina. So there are three interrelated um, documents and initiatives. I'm going to be speaking primarily about this first one, responsible data sharing to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but RUSE has also done a um, survey of biobanking activities um, that have emerged as a response to COVID-19 which I'll also briefly discuss, which is also incorporated into this main document. And then there's also a um, paper which was published, um, COVID-19 Research Navigating the European General Data Protection Regulation, which um, deals comprehensively with uh, GDPR issues for COVID-19 related research. Uh, next slide, please, Christina. So the responsible data sharing uh, document has two principal aims. Um, so one was to detail changes to ethical and legal frameworks um, the world over. So it's, um, we are trying to see as a way of community learning um, how have different legal and ethical frameworks perhaps changed in response to the pandemic. Um, an example of this would be certain countries, particularly in Europe, have um, changed the types of safeguards that are needed, data protection safeguards that are needed where data processing is undertaken for research purposes. Um, but we also wanted to highlight the flexibility that existed in pre-existing uh, provisions in both ethical and legal frameworks. Um, and key example of this would be uh, the availability of consent waivers, where there's great public interest in research. Um, so at the moment, the document's gone through three iterations, um, and we have contributions from five or six countries in total. So it's um, a very diverse document, um, and I definitely encourage uh, members and new people to contribute. Um, next slide, please, Christina. So I'm going to deal with the three kind of main um, parts of the document. The, the first part is uh, legal and regulatory. So we've um, detailed uh, first privacy and data protection um, norms. And what was interesting here was um, very early on in, in late March, we had statements from different data protection authorities um, saying, you know, data protection will not hinder the pandemic response. But there was always this tension because the question was, well, how do we actually go about doing uh, this very important research while still complying with these data protection norms? And there was this tension of either you adapt the norms or you're going to build technical infrastructures to try and facilitate COVID-19 related research. A key example um, of this would be what uh, France has done. They've set up a, um, a very interesting type of uh, data system, which is meant to exist just for the purposes of studying the pandemic. I believe clinical data can be used for research purposes. Um, and to the right, we have um, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen of 1789. Um, and it was very interesting because there was a constitutional challenge to this um, French initiative and the uh, uh, Conseil d'État and the Conseil Constitutionnel both um, relied on this declaration from the 18th century to justify the legality of the COVID-19 um, research um, data system. Uh, and um, again, we were also focusing on navigating the, the GDPR, but that's more fully brought out in that uh, freestanding article. Um, there's also discussion of intellectual property. Um, there were two kind of principal um, approaches. One was through the consensual basis of 
uh, something called an open COVID pledge. Um, this was uh, spearheaded in part by um, uh, Georgie Contreras, who is um, a member of the regulatory and ethics work stream, and it allows for the licensing of intellectual property for COVID-related purposes. It's a very simple, easy to use license, but this is something that requires intellectual property holders um, to choose to use. And then the compulsory approaches was, was interesting. We saw different measures in um, Israel, Canada, Germany, um, where the state was saying that they would be willing to um, compulsively license or compel the licensing of particular intellectual property if it had a specific purpose for combating the pandemic. Um, uh, we also have some information about medical device regulations, specifically regarding flexibility and expedited approval. Um, this is specifically as regards to PCR tests. Um, and finally, for legal and regulatory, there is a very interesting section regarding the handling of biosamples from uh, participants and patients who have COVID-19. Uh, Next slide, please, Christina. Um, so the second uh, leg of the document involves responsible data sharing policy. Um, so we took the, the welcome statement, which GA for GH uh, signed on, as well as many other uh, leading organizations in the scientific community. And um, it, it's interesting to link it to the Bermuda principles of the genomics community where you know, there's this big emphasis on the open, open and rapid sharing of data. Um, and we just wanted to really call attention to the need for not just sharing uh, data, but also hypotheses, preprints, methods, really anything and everything that could be shared while still maintaining scientific and analytic uh, validity of the, of the research. Um, and we also did want to highlight that when it comes to sharing data, we should be, it should be done responsibly and carefully, and we should take into consideration that not all uh, groups will be necessarily affected by data sharing in the same way. Um, and this is also related to this responsible use uh, subsection um, where we also wanted to call attention to the limitations of research pro uh, products and outputs as they relate to individual um, decision making. So yes, we might be able to generate generalizable knowledge through research, but um, there needs to be a lot of you know, ethical and legal considerations that go into whether or not this is sufficient evidence to make decisions at an individual level. Um, next slide, please, Christina. Um, and the third and uh, final section of the document deals with the varied ethical issues that the pandemic um, presents. So uh, the first subsection is public health ethics. And our purpose here was to try and educate the community um, regarding public health ethics. It's something quite um, new to many members in the community. Some have experience with it, but also many members of the community were perhaps for the first time being pulled into kind of uh, more public health oriented projects rather than typical biomedical research. Um, and we also discuss the potential role that biobanking initiatives can play in um, a public health response. Um, we also spent, there's quite a bit in there about research ethics um, review where uh, we wanted to focus on how processes could be adopted and be flexible to allow for uh, robust review of research projects, but also, um, you know, really taking cognizance of the, the uh, exigencies of the moment where uh, there's so much COVID related research happening and research committees are under uh, great stress. And so we wanted to highlight the different ways in which um, there can be perhaps creativity in both reviewing um, research projects as well as in uh, you know, seeking consent, for example. We, 
we detail different ways through perhaps digital consent or through use of a legally authorized representative to give consent. And we did also want to highlight that even though we are in a pandemic, the use of waivers is still quite exceptional, but the public interest may be elevated due to the pandemic. Um, and finally, for data access um, committees, um, we kind of wanted to highlight that um, DAPs themselves may have little control over the kind of flexibility that they can have, given that it's institutional agreements uh, that they're frequently constrained by, but we did want to um, highlight the need for resources to ensure that DACs are appropriately um, staffed and that they can deal with the deluge of COVID-related uh, data access requests. Uh, next slide, please, Christina. So um, as, a, as a CODA, um, I just wanted to, to thank everyone who has contributed um, to date. I think it's a really um, amazing document that shows how much knowledge is within the ruse. I'm constantly impressed by everyone's contributions and expertise and the really uh, wide ranging knowledge that exists um, among all of us as a group. And if um, any of the newcomers are interested um, in getting involved, please send me an email. My email's um, on that slide. Thank you. Many thanks indeed, Michael. And, and if we could only all sit under an almond tree and blossom right now, that would be a lovely, a lovely thought indeed. Thank you for, for that great presentation. Last but certainly not least, we now get to hear from colleagues um, leading some fantastic work on the participant patient public engagement policy. So Mavis, is it you who's leading this presentation? Yes, it is. Thanks, Ted. Over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Mavis, and I am presenting um, our work on behalf of my colleagues, Madeline and Clara from um, Glasgow and Melbourne Genomics. Um, who obviously couldn't be here, well, not obviously, but they couldn't be here today and they send their apologies. Um, so next slide, please, Christina. So this work is really an accumulation of um, three main things that happened uh, from May 19, May 2019 um, to sort of February um, 2020. The first thing was that in uh, May of last year, we had a workshop, which was initially the National Initiatives, which is now um, the GIF. Um, and we ran a small exercise in that workshop asking three questions around public engagement, um, specifically from a personal perspective, um, asking participants what they knew about public engagement um, in terms of what the initiatives had done um, and also what, um, what worked and what didn't. Um, around uh, the same time, there was a, an internal survey of priorities that was sent um, to the RUSE network and of this engagement came up as a top, top priority um, of something that people wanted guidance on. Um, and so we also conducted a survey, a second survey with initiative representatives and this was more an official take of public engagement activities where we asked similar questions to what was in the workshop. Um, but in this case, we wanted you know, the official voice of what the initiatives thought public engagement was and what they were doing. Uh, next slide, please. We found that um, in all three, the, well, in the survey, the second survey and the workshop, there's a lot of, um, a, a large amount of expertise around what public engagement does, what it can do, um, and what activities are actually being conducted. But we also found some gaps, as you can see. Um, we found that there were gaps around who is actually defined when we talk about the public, what um, counts as public engagement, uh, because the activities were so diverse, it was really difficult for some time, sometimes for people to figure out what it was they meant when we're talking about public engagement. One of the things that also came out was how do we do public engagement better than we're currently doing and how do we evaluate its impact. Um, and this led us to the next slide. Um, it led us to um, creating an an engagement activity resource, which I'm happy to say is currently under review. Uh, the aim of this resource was to create a, knowledge, a sort of a knowledge exchange catalog, which would highlight the ongoing um, engagement practices and the notes and links that um, the GH community can access and also learn from in terms of what other driver projects and initiatives are doing. Um, and so it's open to all 75 gifts and driver projects. And actually we see that although there's similar activities that happen within some of the um, uh, settings, 
they also differ in terms of how they're being conducted. So you could have surveys, but the information that's given around how those surveys are being done or what is being asked actually differs. And this was something that we found interesting. Um, and it also then led us to thinking about creating a policy and guidance, um, also speaking to the survey from last year about what the, the guidance people wanted about how to do public engagement. The aims of the policy is obviously to improve engagement practices, but also to ensure that genomics activities are socially accepted and aligned with people's concerns. And I think this, I'm not really sure who circled that, but this is something that's really important to us. So thank you for circling that for us. Um, it's one of the underlying reasons that we think engagement practices should really kind of be elevated. Next slide, please. Um, so when we started thinking about the policy, we had a lot of assumptions on our part, thinking about um, trying to move engagement from just informing people to engaging them in decision making, thinking of engagement more as a two way process, thinking of the collective, but to change practice as well. And actually what we then found is that context really matters. And in the next slide, please. Uh, we came up with, uh, well, we got people interested in a discussion group and it really quickly turned those assumptions uh, on their head. And what we found was engagement is really complex and trying to think about um, what engagement is means you have to really unpick what the project is about, who's involved, what timelines they have available to them, what funding is available. All of these things are actually important to think about when people um, then decide on a strategy to use for their um, engagement in their project. So over the course of the last eight or so months, we've had uh, between 15 to 25 people engaged in these discussions um, and they all come from different backgrounds. So we've got patient representatives, we've got patient advocates, clinicians, privacy experts and people in academia. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Christina. Um, so first of all, a big thank you to the discussion group because actually the the way the policy, well, the way we've been thinking about an engagement policy has really changed. And I think it's made the upcoming policy a lot better. Uh, one of the things that we want to stress in the policy is that there's no singular, uh, no, there's no single way to do um, effective engagement. As people will see when we share the policy, um, it's about what is about thinking of engagement as a how rather than a what do I need to do. Um, we don't have a, a set list of things to tick off because a tick list doesn't actually get people thinking deeply about what they're doing. The two main principles that we want people to continue to think about as they think about engagement is fairness and justice. And actually this really bodes well with uh, GA4J's framework for responsible data sharing and the work that the diversity inclusion group are doing. So in our policy, um, we encourage thinking through a set of questions of four key principles. Um, and we'll see these on the next slide. Uh, we came up with four principles, of, so not principles, key elements of fairness, context, uh, heterogeneity, which is also um, the, uh, sort of the differences between people. Um, and so in fairness, we're saying, you know, think about what your work does and guard against reproduction of inequalities and power dynamics. The context, like I mentioned earlier, the people, the stage, the project is at, the funding, all of those things are different circumstances that need to be considered when people are thinking of um, engagement and also embracing the difference between perspectives of all the different people that might be the patients, the publics um, or participants, because all of these people might have different perspectives of how they want to be involved or engaged as a project continues. Um, and one of the things that we also came up, um, also realized what that was that differences can cause conflicts or tensions. And we didn't want this to be something that had to be buried, but actually to embrace tension because it arises from differences and differences are not always a bad thing. So where we're at at the moment, next slide please, Christina, is we're finalizing the policy draft and we're going to sh then share it for review, both internally and externally, according to um, J4J processes. And once the catalog is finalized, it will be published. Um, and we're looking forward to receiving comments from everyone. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Mavis. And that's a, um, such an important project and necessarily going in these steps uh, through, through the way I think will lead to a much, much stronger and internationally endorsed uh, policies. So well worth, well worth uh, this little journey there. Um, 
So, Christina, I believe we now have some time for some questions, comments, and feedback. So, colleagues, um, by all means, uh, this is not a Slido session. So, just raise your your uh, blue hand or uh, type into the chat box. And we'll, I'm sure uh, uh, the panelists who presented and myself will be happy to answer any questions. And, and Jan, I think, is also available uh, to chime in as a co-chair as well. So, does anyone have any questions or comments they'd like to make now? Uh, Ted, it's Martha Compras here. Hi there. Hello. Hi. Um, I, I uh, wrote to Anna and so on when this fantastic paper on this incredible project came out. And I was, uh, it, it, it could be, um, I don't know, what is the reason um, other than trust? Is it, is it that genomics or genetic testing is not part of the health care system in a lot of the countries um, that were involved. It's more of a luxury item or limited to um, developed countries. The, the low, the low um, interest in data sharing, or is it because data sharing isn't understood? I, I'd like a little bit more detail if possible, uh, Richard, on, on, on that particular uh, figure. You know what? I think Richard had to jump off the call. I've <laughs> every serves. Unfortunately, I think he had to step away. Um, and about 10, 15 minutes ago, if um, Christina's not in her head, so I think I think poor Richard is no longer able to answer the question. So <laughs> might might uh, might I suggest we we email him? And I see there's another great question coming in um, uh, from uh, Subashini, who says, was the U.S. included in the Your DNA, uh, Your Say survey? So we'll take note of these questions and make sure that uh, Richard uh, is able, because I don't think uh, Anna Middleton is, was able to join us for, for this time either. So uh, apologies for that. Um, Ted, this is Vaso. Perhaps along the same lines, um, you know, we, we heard several times uh, in some of the plenaries about the Global Alliance's um, interest in moving more in the clinical sector. And I'm wondering um, about, you know, the, how that is, is being taken up by the ruse. What's the pulse of um, the ruse? Because this opens, you know, a, a very different door um, from a regulatory standpoint in our in our respective jurisdictions. And are we um, are we supportive of this move? Um, are we, you know, proceeding with caution and, and trepidation? So I'm I'm curious about the pulse of this group in that regard. Great question, Val. So thank you for raising that. So I mean, I. My sense is, I mean, this was a, 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 a need or desire um, mentioned by the Global Alliance community about looking at the interplay between, between the clinic and research. And I think that some of the work that in particular is being done in, with all of our, our consent toolkit, uh, and you heard the plethora uh, of, of, of different activities just on, on, in the realm of consent, I think are thinking about how this bridge can be done and, and, and clinical sequencing using the, the data that's derived from clinical sequencing and applying it in a research context is, is really something that the RUSE is doing. So um, in short, I do believe that it is, it is seen as, as a really important element and it's an extremely difficult element as many of you know. Um, but I'm thinking about the consent work, I'm thinking about uh, some of the questions that have been posed to us in the GDPR forum um, you know, I'm thinking about uh, the other policies that we're still working on, such as, such as the, the engagement policy. And I think all of this is not necessarily with a view exclusively to the research context, but very much also thinking about how we can, how we can consider that bridge across both and ultimately try to, to bridge the divide that uh, sometimes seems to exist, recognizing, as you say, Vaso, that there are uh, a fair number of regulatory differences that need to be navigated and potentially also ethical ones as well. I don't know okay. if you just wanted to chime in there for that. Yeah. Is that. Hi, Jan Friedman. Nice to see you again. Hi. Um, can uh, I if I can just well? follow up on uh, Vaso's uh, question, I, I think the issue goes beyond the bridge 
uh, to clinical implementation of these technologies and how we can share data that is obtained not for research at all, but as part of uh, clinical care, because clinically we need these data, this data sharing as well in order to um, uh, facilitate the clinical use of, of uh, genomic technologies. Thank you, Jan, for that. Christine, did you, did you want to uh, chime yes, in? Yes, I, I, I just wanted to, um, I mean, obviously talking from the perspective of the uh, genomic signal, and these are my personal reflections, I think it's essential that we um, engage with this challenge mm. because, um, again, because of this very close link between geno genomes that are used in the clinic, the amount of data we're going to get, the ability to link to healthcare data, which is essential for the research and the clinical practice. And also, once you're linked in with the clinical world, you've got the possibility of re-identification for um, different purposes, of recontact. They, they're all difficult things to work through and operationalize. But I think it's only if we the standards also incorporate the reality of what we have to manage in our ethical and regulatory governance frames in the clinical work that will drive maximum benefit from developing this work. And also the clinical world will derive maximum benefit as well from the standards. Thank you, Christina. And I see Bartek Knoppers has mentioned in the chat that the, the name Global Alliance is really uh, chosen to include health to pave the translational pathway. So this is very much, I think, the founding ethos. Or I don't know if you wanted to, to chime in here, um, speak to that further. No, if the mute's on. Uh, Ten, I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, this was this was a long discussion um, way back, and and it uh, deliberately wanted to make sure that it wasn't research um, that would not be able to serve uh, the healthcare uh, the or the eventual health needs or actual health needs of research uh, participants, and and so that translational pathway uh, was actually. Uh, one of sort of the exciting opportunities that distinguish this from the Human Genome Organization or other, or the um, uh, 1000 Genomes Project or other global um, fundamental research. It, it actually was meant to, to build those kinds of bridges. Thank you, thank you, uh, Vaso, again for that question. It's then encouraging. I'm... It's encouraging to hear all that because it does open, you know, a whole, you know, slew of new possibilities, new um, uh, ideas for policy development uh, when we consider the clinical imp implementation side of things. So I'm, you know, really encouraged to see the organization, you know, really move more towards that direction, and there there is commitment um, to to put efforts towards that goal. Thank you. Are there any final questions, comments from, from our participants today? If not, uh, I see Christina has helpfully put the slide up. So I hope all of you, uh, assuming the time zone is friendly to you, are able to join us for our annual uh, Ruse meeting tomorrow. So that's at 2.30 p.m. UTC, 10.30 a.m. East Coast time. Um, and so please do join us. It's an hour and a half scheduled. A lot, a lot of uh, discussion to be had, uh, not just some of the presentations we heard today, but updated on all the sorts of work that, that's been done. So there's, we're, we're a hive of activity um, uh, in years past, and it's still very much the case, uh, even, even in this new normal of, of remote working. Uh, so I do hope you're able to, to tune in and hear some of the updates from, from all the different uh, teams that are involved in our work stream. I want to thank again very much um, all our panelists, uh, uh, speakers uh, today for, for the four fantastic presentations. Thank you again to, to Michael and to Christina for your excellent uh, uh, coordination and help for this. And thank you uh, to all of you uh, for joining today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and evening and hope to see many of you tomorrow. Take good care. <laughs>